morning. The Old Testament today is from Genesis 12, 1 through 4a. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to make the land, or say, to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The second reading is from the New Testament, John 3, 1 through 21. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these things that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these, th these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet, you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe him believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Well, you already told, heard me talk to the young people about having trouble falling asleep. I can remember as a child being reluctant to go to bed 
because I was afraid of the monster under the bed just waiting to get me once I fell asleep. It is a classic fear of young children. <clears throat> I also remember my parents coming to me and trying to comfort me. My dad even got on his hands and knees to look under the bed to reassure me that there was nothing under there. We all grow up and we stop worrying about monsters under the bed, but at night when our minds won't stop thinking about all the things that we have left undone, or the things that we fear and have no control over, it feels just a little bit like our childhood monsters. At night with the lights off and everyone else in the house asleep, it is easy to let our imaginations go wild with all those demons and monsters. You know, I wonder if that was what happened on that night when Nicodemus woke up and then couldn't go back to sleep, wondering about this new rabbi that seemed to be stirring things up. But unlike most of us nighttime warriors, Nicodemus decided to get up, to get dressed, and to go talk to Jesus. Not a bad example of what maybe we ought to do. Now, we're only at chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. And yet, a whole lot of things have happened by the time we get to this story. John the baptizer has been questioned by the Pharisees if he might be the Messiah. John then baptizes Jesus in the River Jordan and sees the Spirit descend on Jesus, proclaiming Jesus as God's Son. Jesus then begins calling his disciples. He has performed his first sign, that's what John refers to the miracles as, by turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Jesus has already gone to Jerusalem for the Passover. And unlike the other Gospels, this is the time at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry when he overturns the money changers' tables in the temple. These are all the events that have already taken place and those Pharisees, they are paying attention because they're not quite sure about this fella. And as we are told at the very beginning of Ch uh, John's um, chapter 3, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. So it is not at all strange that he too would be worrying about Jesus. Could he be the Messiah? What I think is strange and important is that Nicodemus does get up and go to Jesus in the middle of the night, in the dark. And what may be the most miraculous thing of all is Jesus welcomes Nicodemus into the conversation that we then hear. I think it's important for us to remember that the very beginning of John's Gospel, what is always referred to as the prologue, begins with that po those poetic verses that make the distinction between darkness and light. Because in John's Gospel, we are continually being reminded of the darkness of the world and Jesus as the light in the world. Now, I extended this morning's gospel reading to include what Jesus has to say about the people who love darkness, despite the fact that Jesus represents the light of God's kingdom, because I think it's important for us to see that connection there at the beginning of this gospel. Now, the first thing Nicodemus says, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Not exactly the questioning that we've heard from the Pharisees already. 
And Jesus' response is, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. This conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus is one of multiple misunderstandings. And right here in these two sentences, we are already presented with the first loaded misunderstanding. Now I'll admit that I did not notice this in any of the times I've read this scripture before. And this is the miracle of God. God is always introducing new ideas to us. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God coming near, as he does in many other places in the gospel. I don't think it was ever important to Jesus that he be identified as the Messiah. I think what was important to Jesus was that he wanted to help people to experience the presence of God in their daily lives. And Jesus' suggestion is that knowing God's presence can only come from being in relationship with God. And that was the transformation that Jesus wanted people to experience. And Jesus talked about it as the kingdom of God. Now, as I've already suggested, there is a lot going on in this story. And one significant part of the story is Nicodemus saying to Jesus that what Jesus proposes just isn't possible, especially once Nicodemus hears Jesus say that he must be born again. Because he, Nicodemus says, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time in the, to the mother's womb and be born? Well, it makes perfect sense to us. Beyond the obvious is the suggestion that Nicodemus can't imagine, as old as he is, learning something new and different. That however, is exactly what Jesus is encouraging. A new way of thinking. Any of you ever have that problem? Not really wanting to learn something new because we're so used to what we've always understood? You see, clearly Jesus and Nicodemus are saying two different things to one another. In fact, they are talking past one another. And here's part of the reason. You see, there is a Greek word in this text, anathen. And it can be translated to mean more than one thing. What is even more amazing is that different translations of the Bible emphasize one meaning over another. If you put two or three different translations of the Bible next to each other, you'd see a different emphasis in this text, which may make it even more difficult for us to recognize what might be going on in this scripture between Jesus and Nicodemus. You see, Jesus uses the Greek word to mean from above. But what Nicodemus hears, this alternative translation, is born again. When presented in this way, it becomes much more understandable why there is so much confusion in this conversation. It really does look like Jesus and Nicodemus are talking past each other. Jesus then tries to clarify what he is saying. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Now this is where we Christians interpret this conversation between two Jewish teachers as if they are talking about what we know to be baptism. We hear Jesus talk about water and we immediately jump to baptism. We assume that what we call baptism and that ritual purification that Jews observed using the mikvah, 
are the same, and they aren't. You see, the use of the mikvah and the act of ritual purification in Judaism is what John the Baptist was performing in the wilderness. It was a regular ritual that Jews practiced that preceded the opportunity to restore a person's relationship with God. It is this idea that Jesus suggests to Nicodemus when he talks about water and spirit. So, it is helpful if we understand this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus as two Jewish teachers discussing what they believe about their relationship to God. Our Christian understanding of baptism comes much later after Jesus' death, his resurrection and ascension, after centuries of persecution of early Christians, and after the acceptance of Christianity as the state religion of Rome. 300 years later is when baptism becomes a critical part of what Christians believed. So what Jesus is talking about here is that ritual purification that made God accessible to the Jews again. And Nicodemus is an important Pharisee because he will show up later in John's Gospel. And amazingly, he shows up as a sympathizer to Jesus and his disciples. He argues with the other Pharisees that we need to hear what Jesus is saying when all the others are just ready to string him up. Nicodemus is speaking out of his knowledge of the world and it, its ways even as he affirms that given what has been happening, Jesus surely is someone who has a significant understanding of God. You know, there's one more time when Nicodemus shows up. It's after Jesus' death. And he helps to anoint Jesus' body. You know, perhaps we need to begin to appreciate the real resistance Nicodemus and I think we experience when we hear God's promises. You see, God's promises are often kind of nonsensical. It is almost impossible to believe that those promises are possible when we look at them from the world's perspective. But you see, that's the problem. We have to look at God's promises from God's perspective, not the world's. In this morning's lesson from Genesis, we hear God make an astounding promise to Abram. He hasn't become Abraham yet. But this promise requires that Abram trust God and leave all that he knows, his home, his family, everything and go where God is leading him without any knowledge of what the end point will be. Abram believes God and he goes. And then God promises Abram, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I would like to point out to you that this promise is made to a man who is old and his wife who is barren. A promise that seems impossible. And you know what? There are other characters in the Bible that have similar experiences. Though, you know, as I thought about them, I have to admit that it is curious how many of those characters happen to be women. Just saying. Abraham's wife, Sarah, is told that she will have a child long after her childbearing days are, have gone. 
Naomi can't imagine why Ruth stays with her when she can't provide a man to protect either of them. And I suspect that if we started looking, we would find many examples in the Bible where God makes promises to humankind that just don't make any sense. And you know, we will experience this again on Easter morning. People don't walk out of their burial tombs, or do they? But that's where we demonstrate our inability to really trust in God when we aren't able to set aside what we know to be true in the world and consider that God is able to overcome those obstacles and make something possible that we can't even imagine. Maybe not a bad idea for us to carry with us in our current lives here in this world where everyone is becoming more and more frightened of something called coronavirus. Despite all of this, what really jumps out to me about our lesson from John's Gospel is Jesus' emphasis on relationship. Our relationship to God and our relationship to one another. These relationships, more than anything else, are what defines God's kingdom. These relationships are what brings God's light into the world. These relationships are why Jesus was born, why he lived, and why he died, and why he was raised from the dead, so that we would have the opportunity to experience God's love for each of us. Just as we hear in this most famous of Bible verses, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have an everlasting life. I wonder sometimes if we put too much emphasis on verse 16 and we kind of ignore verse 17, which I think is equally important. They ought to be together every time. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. If we pay close attention to John's Gospel, I think it points to loving relationships that we see Jesus establish over and over again. And often the stories we hear of people who don't deserve God's love but Jesus teaches us that we all, all of us, deserve God's love. Not because we are good or sin, sinless, but because we are part of God's good creation that we hear about in the first chapter of Genesis when God creates everything and declares all of it very good. Now, I'll admit to you that I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to end this sermon. But here it goes. This morning, we are confronted with God's amazing promise to Abram. And then Jesus' patient conversation with the Pharisee, Nicodemus. And both of those are examples of the love that God has for all of us. Amen.